Hello, hello everyone. My name is John Edwards. With me as always is Zeke Baker and we are the Dad Drinking Bourbon. Say hello, Zeke. Hello, hello. Salutations to all. And it is a very special night for us tonight because we have a special guest here in studio. We have Heath Clark, who is the proprietor, head man, big honcho of the Heath Clark Distillery, the H. Clark Distillery. Thank you very much for joining us, Heath. Well, happy to be here. You know, being head honcho of H. Clark, that's a little bit like uh, start my own country so I can be president, I guess. But, you know, (laughs) it is... (laughs) I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. No, we are very, very happy to have you. It's not often that we actually get someone who wants to come hang out with us. It's as important as you, so it's it's kind of a new thing for us. <laughs> <laughs> good whiskey and uh, I travel. It's uh, it's pretty simple. And you know, I had a pretty good day. It's not just uh, dad's drinking bourbon, but uh, this dad makes a little bourbon. And uh, so I spent the day, uh, got up, made some uh, Christmas cookies with the kids and had a big time and cleaned up a bunch of messes. And so it's uh, it was a good Sunday way to um, sort of get it all in. Well, and that's the thing that is kind of cool having you here is you are not only a, you're not only a distiller, you're not only the owner of a distillery, but you are also a dad drinking bourbon. And that's kind of another interesting thing to have you here because you kind of fit the mold. It, it's kind of a, a natural thing to have you here. Well, it's good to be here. And uh, I appreciate the, the hospitality and a man could get hurt trying to drink all this whiskey. So this is an impressive, uh, impressive collection. So, uh. Not everybody knows that we've <laughs> we said we were going to start recording. I told Heath to come over at eight thirty, and it is now ten o'clock. For those of you that are keeping track, and we've probably tried everything under the sun before we got on here. And a good tasting doesn't take a lot of stuff, but we sure have gone through a lot, haven't we, Zeke? We have, we have, and you know. Also, I think it's important to note that this whiskey project, so to speak, is really a project of passion, not a primary revenue stream. That's true. Yeah, so, we don't make yeah, any no. money off of this. No, that, I, that I, sounds I, familiar. I mean, the the H. Clark Distillery <clears throat> is not, you know, what you're relying on to, to keep the lights on and put, you know, food on the table. It's just truly, you know, following a passion, which is wonderful absolutely you know i'm a i'm a practicing attorney and, and still still practice and that's definitely our primary uh, uh source of revenue um hopefully if, you know folks will drink more i could lawyer less but for now uh i'm gonna stick with my uh, two jobs and one honest profession how bad are the lawyer jokes oh you know a lot of them are pretty bad and they're not not that they're offensive because it's pretty hard to offend me but they're just not funny you know, we've earned as a profession, we've earned a lot of those jokes, <laughs> quite <laughs> honestly. So uh, we're fair game and deserve it, uh, unfortunately. I guess if a lot of people are drinking your whiskey, then other lawyers then actually have a boost in business. So depending on if they drink responsibly or not. So I hope not. You know, we uh, I told a joke for a while that I, I was... Uh, we're going to start doing DUI work. You know, I'm a, I'm a paperwork lawyer. I do corporate transactional M&A and I thought, you know, if I could do uh, DUI work, I could put my own picture up in the bathroom at my distillery, but decided not to do that and keep just doing deals and buying and selling stuff or helping folks do that. You decided to start distilling and, and actually getting into this in 2008. That's something that it's been a while. You actually opened your doors in 2014. So what actually went into making your distillery and getting to where you are today? What I've been doing the last decade. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> on top of the day job because i think a lot of people don't realize what actually goes into it like so you want to start a craft distillery and a lot of times it's easier said than done right starting anything is always easier said than done you know it's been a long journey um i grew up on a small farm you know between telehoma and winchester and had family you know my uncle bill's been at jack daniels since 1981 uh, he's been their engineering manager for i don't know 15 or 20 years as well and as part of that, you know, we're really close with, with he and his family. We went to the distillery a lot. People kind of look at me funny. Well, I spent a lot of time at Jack Daniels when I was a kid, and but that's true. Now there's this nice uh, event space at Jack that's called Barbecue Hill. For years, it was just an old smoker. So at 4th of July or Christmas or birthdays, we were always running out to, to Jack to pick up or drop off some ham or ribs or shoulders or something. You know, we'd go out there with Bill, and he'd go check stuff out. And, man, I just love the place, the way it smells, the efficiency of the operation. But the smell of whiskey is, I fell in love with it long before I ever tasted it. For me, I apparently talked about it a lot. You know, about 10 years ago, my, my then boss looked at me and was like, you need to shut up and go do this. 
The problem was, and this was you know 2007, 2008, it was, it was illegal to do that in Tennessee. So Tennessee's got this sort of funny relationship with whiskey where we've, we've made a lot of it throughout our state's history. But we've been the first state to outlaw it, and we've done that twice. The first time was by the, the Confederate government of Tennessee outlawed whiskey production because there was too many resources going to the production of whiskey, so much so they couldn't field an army. They had to outlaw whiskey production in order to field an army, which is just insane. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what fields an army? Uh, you is, know, is they didn't outlaw whiskey? drinking, just making, just making. But we did it again in 2010, where or excuse me, 1910, where there were nearly, you know, there were several hundred registered distilleries in Tennessee by then. In 1910, Tennessee outlawed spirits production and horse racing, which is just nuts. <laughs> and all this, you know, all this stuff just went, moved to Kentucky. 1910, great year for Kentucky, not so much for Tennessee. Which is funny because I actually, back in my old career, I used to do the horse racing radio network. And it's really frustrating for me living in Tennessee because you can't, there's no gaming. No. And and you it's well, lottery tickets. You know. Yeah. And you can't even get T V G. You have to do an extra thing with direct T V to get T V G if you actually want to watch horse racing. That's that's the worst part about it. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. yeah. I just wonder how much childbirth fell off subsequently. Because <laughs> if there was no alcohol, no no gambling, no horse racing, a lot of men no longer had fun in their life. I yeah, I, I, I think the the whole childbirth thing must have dropped subsequently the That'd next be a couple fun, of years. You know, statistical study wouldn't it to look at the you know sort of birth <laughs> rates <laughs> along with the prohibition you know where most of the country sort of only had to live with the that insanity of prohibition for about 13 years tennessee had it for nearly 30 when we got around to allowing access to alcohol this is in 1939 we had this voter referenda scheme that was uh if you want liquor by the drink, vote. If you want retail package sales, vote. Now, this is every county, every city. You had to take this up on their own. Most folks had forgotten, certainly by 2009, was if you wanted to manufacture spirits in the state, you had to have a voter referendum on that. And uh, that just struck me as insane. Like, we didn't vote on Nissan coming to town. They just <laughs> they just showed up, and you know everybody was better for it. As I sort of looked into how to get open, you know, for me it was, you know, moving home really wasn't an option given uh, sort of family circumstances and voter referendums are expensive to pull that off. Uh, the path of least resistance to, to start out was uh, take on this referendum scheme to get going. And so uh, I had an idea that I bet the folks who were okay with drinking whiskey were also okay with people making it and, you know, sketched out some legislation that did that. That bill got... <laughs> Sponsored, uh, my dentist got in front of another patient of his who picked up the bill. A lot of folks started pushing that rock up the hill, too. It was, it was pretty incredible. The, the folks at Corsair uh, were incredibly important with that. Mike Williams and Carrie McKeel, an impressive group of people who came together around that legislation in 09. And they got done in like four months from sponsorship, which is just insane. But wow. do you think that's a little bit of right place, right time? Because you not... Every distiller that's coming in there is a lawyer that has that experience pushing paper and, and the M&A experience you have. Is that something that you think allowed you to kind of offset costs? Because for some people that were going to go actually push legislation, that costs a lot of money. They don't necessarily know how to write everything. They don't know the right people to talk to. Do you think that you were... And, and I know it's awkward to ask you to say that, but do you think you were the right person, right time, right place in order to actually change the culture in Tennessee? I definitely think there was a window and an opportunity that presented on the idea. The idea was right. There were a lot of people who were interested in making spirits. Where I think the idea worked is that it wasn't a frontal assault on the, the choice prerogative in the state. And so that's important. You know, if people want access to alcohol, that's their right to pick on a, and on a locality basis. The reason that legislation worked was that it preserved choice. You know, the municipalities and counties that were okay with access to alcohol could then be okay with manufacturing, but it didn't affect any dry counties. And so there was no real reason for the folks in dry counties to oppose the legislation. And so your primary opposition was uh, removed. You didn't pick a fight with them. You don't want whiskey, you don't vote for it. It's fine. And so by maintaining choice, this idea was able to open up most of the state to uh, distillation. Now, 
one of the funny things in Tennessee is we have this. A lot of legislators will take their county or city out of a bill if they don't like it for some reason. And so a lot of eligible counties took themselves out of that bill back in 2009. The uh, the great buyer's remorse bill came back around <laughs> in 2013 and put them back in. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Well, and if you look at some places, we, you and I have talked about it before, Chattanooga. That yeah, we Hamilton like County Chattanooga took themselves run. out, yeah. Hamilton County took themselves out, and then Chattanooga Whiskey, in order to get back into everything in 2013, they had to go and, and bring the change the law again, right? Yeah. And it wasn't, it's hard enough to, to fix, you know, the self-inflicted gunshot wound in our foot that is sort of lasted since 2009 and folks in chattanooga i like those guys uh they had to patch up both feet because chattanooga shot themselves in the foot on purpose in 2009 we get through legislation yeah so i want to start a distillery yeah so uh what um, actually goes into that oh because gosh. i think a lot of people think it's it's easier said than done right you know, I don't know how everyone's experience was. I, I just know mine. And uh, H. Clark Distillery is, is my second attempt. The first one, y'all may have heard of businesses that are too big to fail. Well, there are such things as businesses that are too big to get started. And, <laughs> <laughs> and mine was one of those. The bill passed though nine. Oh, great. Let's go. Well, you know, this, this idea for a distillery left the core sort of passion and then just kept got getting bigger. And so it, it collapsed in on itself. And I ended up, I was still an in-house lawyer at that point. I ended up, you know, I actually got laid off from my uh, in-house job and had a decision to make, which was, you know, what am I going to do? Am I going to go back and be an in-house lawyer somewhere else or keep doing this? It was, is the dream dead, so to speak. And in the middle of the great uh, recession, I started my own law practice, which, you know, in hindsight, Seems kind of crazy, but <laughs> there was no way I was I was going to go back into uh, the same situation I just gotten let go from. And so I started my law practice. And uh, about two years in, you know, we got sort of regrouped, restabilized. Things were okay again. I was talking to Becky, and it's like I have to do this. I just got to get out of my system. She said, "All right, if we're going to do this, you're going to put your name on it, and you're only going to do things that you want your name on." And that's been our guiding ethic ever since. There's nothing more important certainly in the legal profession, than your reputation. And that's how we've staked out our brand and our products at H. Clark. And every step of the way, we, we've trusted in the tradition of products and traditions in Tennessee to get there. Making whiskey is the easy part of starting a distillery. Anybody wants to start a distillery, you need to build a checklist. And Roman numeral one needs to be get permission because you're going to need permission from you know God and everybody to get going it's state and local it's zoning it's land use you know the feds have a play a big part the feds are the irs just so everybody's aware of that we're governed by the irs as distilleries who don't refer to the whiskey or the spirits but they talk about the revenue you've got to get through a lot of paperwork you've got to get your labels approved you got to get your bottles approved i mean it's approvals everywhere so be ready for uh, lots of red tape being a being a healthcare lawyer i'm sort of used to that stuff uh, but it, it's daunting every month we file four reports and a couple of tax returns so that's every month wait and every month every month yeah we filed three different production reports we file sales tax returns we have excise tax returns our own use state excise tax returns and so you know it's every month you're you are keeping up with and reporting on what you're doing so um it's a lot even if you're sort of used to it and then there's not even talking about the other stuff it's barrels it's still it's grains it's all that other stuff and and we can kind of lump all that stuff into Mm -hmm. one you you build your mm-hmm. mash bill. You got to get your uh, supply chain down. You've got to figure out how you're going to run your production, and that's still the easy part. Then you got to go sell it. Uh, you know the re- the reality is is I don't know enough people to keep me in business. My friends drank enough to keep our doors open, then you know all my friends would die. But don't uh, all your friends just come to you and say, "Hey, can't you hook me up?" Is that is that part of the problem you, too? You know. Uh, believe it or not, no. Um, I've not had one single friend come and just say, hey, can you hook me up? Most of, all, well, all of our friends who come visit, they buy because they want to support the brand. And that's which what a good friend so does, right? Which has been so cool. Yeah, I've not had one person just sort of be a grifter and, and you know, lurch around. Uh-oh. And I hadn't really thought about that till now. And that that's pretty cool. You're expected to bring the good stuff at the party, though. Right? That's right. We do occasionally bring uh, bring uh, party favors in. But, you know, making the whiskey, then then selling it, promoting it, building your brand. You know, um, you know my mom's certainly proud of me, but that doesn't 
that doesn't sell whiskey. And so how do you get out and, and tell other people about it? And we can't really afford billboards either. So if, if, you're, if you can't, you know, afford the $15,000 for a garden and gun ad, you know, what do you do? You just show up every, you know, every opportunity you can. And you go you, on podcasts. You go <laughs> on podcasts. You do tastings at spirit stores that'll have you and you just, it's just drops in a bucket. You, you just keep showing up till people know you're there. Well, at the same time, I, I would honestly think that showing up at a store and doing tastings would yield much more revenue than a gardening gun ad or a billboard. The, at least to me, perception wise, when I see these things, if you're having to go that route, it's not necessarily more money than cents to a degree. I, I would, I would chalk it up to that. You know, it, or maybe it's a, a good financial backer. It's about your ambitions out of the gate. You know, for us, you know, we, we make a barrel of whiskey a week. We don't have to sell that barrel in order to keep the lights on. You know, we need to sell some of it, but we don't need to sell all of it. And so our financial model is, is really premised on longevity. You know, I want to be here five, 10, 20 years from now. You know, I'm not looking to build a brand and sell it. I'm looking to build a company that, that's mine and that, will work for me as long as I'm willing to work for it. And so knowing that it's a long game, you know, I don't, we didn't structure our distillery so that right out of the gate, I got to sell 50,000 cases of something to keep the lights on. And so if, if your cost structure is such that, man, you got to go, you better get some you know, revenue in the door. It can make sense uh, for people to make those sorts of spins because they've got to reach bigger audiences much faster. Uh, well, we can be patient and sort of chip away and do that. Well, it's funny you say that because, you know, 90% of whiskey is marketing and then the 10% is whiskey. Too. Right. <laughs> but if you think about it, nobody's sitting here and saying like, H. Clark battled, uh, right? yeah, you know, no. battled 15 giants before he made his whiskey. And, you know, <laughs> Elijah Craig is out there. He was the first one toasting charred oak barrels. And, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, if you think about the stuff that is out there, and I said Elijah Craig, but there's a lot of marketing and, and storytelling that goes into a bottle. And, yeah. and for you guys, I mean, it's you. We don't, right. the, the, the beauty of our, for me with our story is that we didn't have to make it up. You know, it, I don't have to remember the story. I just sort of tell it. And, uh, that's, that's a luxury really, you know, it's, and there's, you know, we're sort of no frills. There's not a lot of stuff in our distiller that doesn't make whiskey or spirits. Um, there's not a lot on our bottles that isn't pretty direct and what we have to do. We, we also make a, a gin, which, if you like gin and whiskey, you're, you're my kind of person. We're pretty simple with that, um, our process. And for me, creating excellent, excellence through simplicity is the highest form of art. I think vodka is sort of the worst offender on the story, right? You know, this stuff was distilled 75 times and filtered through a moon rock and polar bear hair and all the rest of it. In today's world, I know I crave authenticity. I'm, I'm attracted to people who are, are authentic. You can tell, and so we just really try to keep it real and uh, show people who we are. So let's kind of skip ahead, right? You go through all the permits, you go through all that stuff, and then you actually get to distill. And you started off doing a gin, a new whiskey, and then a black and tan, right? Those were the, the three things that you really kind of went for at first. The first thing we did was we started making bourbon and laying down barrels. It took us another nine months to figure out our gin. And so... Once we got licensed, you know, we started R&D on the gin and how do we make a gin that we like. Um, and it took us nine months to work through that. And so we spent months with just botanicals. You know, what what in the world is a juniper berry? What in the world is orris root? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it's funny. It's the first thing you said because I'm admittedly not a gin person. But if someone says gin, what pops in my head is juniper. And I don't know why. I don't know what it means. I, I just know I, I'm not a gin fan. But juniper is the word that comes to mind juniper you know the definition so if you ask me what something is I always you know being a lawyer i go to its definition it's legal definition well it's a no spe- i've i've spent time doing technology with you guys and you could sit there for three days and fight with me on one word oh, so yeah. i don't trust that so uh you know gin is a spirit flavored with predominantly with juniper berries that's it and so juniper you know is like a cedar tree kind of looks like a cedar tree and the juniper berry is the pine cone of the cedar tree. 
And the, the funny thing is it looks like a blueberry. It's about the same size, same color even, but they taste different. <laughs> And so, you know, we, you know, worked through what all these botanicals were. We, uh, we being uh, my wife and I, Becky. And so we have a uh, six botanical gin. And so we worked on balance and flavor production, flavor consistency, which, you know, to be honest with you, the gin's harder to make than whiskey. Huh. Yeah. That's interesting because it, I mean, the turnover is quick though, right? I mean, it's kind of like vodka good in a few days. Yeah, it takes, you know, it takes about a week or so for us to turn gin. And it needs about 10 days to sit around. It's kind of like gumbo, you know, it, it those flavors have to marry. But each botanical is a variable. Your temperature is a variable. Your rate of distillation is a variable. Some batches of juniper berries are more intense than others. You know, we use uh, angelica root, which is a kind of a cousin to ginger. And, man, some of that stuff will burn you out. It's hot. And some of it's pretty mild. And so... Each batch, we've got to figure out what is this particular batch of uh, botanicals doing. With whiskey, you, you can mess up a batch, but you can salvage some of the alcohol and sort of fix it. Just redistill it, unless you burn your mash, which that's another story. But with gin, man, you, you, you can't really fix it. It's, it's right or it's wrong, and those are expensive mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure, and it's uh, you know, also, I guess, relatable into other things where relationships you could have cooking. You can give anybody a recipe. Yeah. But, uh, you know, mama's biscuits taste better than so-and-so's biscuits down the street, and they cook them the same way, supposedly. Oh, you know, and I, I've got barbecue recipes and at the house, and I write this stuff down. And to this day, I'm still the only one who remembers the variables. And I'm like, oh, I need to make a note about that. But then I'm, I skip it, you know, because I <laughs> move on to the next thing. And uh, gin's a little bit like that. And, you know, whiskey, you know, it's not just ingredients. It's time in the still and how you how long you let your mash sit and uh, your cuts and we don't have any automation and so there's not a computer telling us or making the cuts it's it's all sensory and so uh that's tough to replicate you know if you're, you're going to automate man every every aspect of your process better be the same every time with the whiskey we're, we're in the gin we're always relying on our nose and, and taste to make our cuts and that lack of automation, you really it plays to our advantage a little bit with with all the variables that we have in our process. Well, also, you know, I would wonder, being smaller, do you have to worry about the consistency of your supply sources and grain and other factors? You know, you're not a big boy that's going to have a guaranteed buy from someone every month, quarter, however you want to view it. So, literally, could could each you know yield that comes in be something completely different that you almost have to play with or tinker and, and figure out ah, we're not re i'm not trying to reinvent the wheel purposely but what i have is a completely different product than what i was sent the last time and now to get to where i want to be what do i need to do differently yeah with with scale you're able to sort of smooth out bumps and process everybody has different glitches and quirks and things aren't always the same uh, they're just more pronounced and noticeable when you're making a barrel a week versus uh, there's this, you know, that small distillery down in Lynchburg, those guys put you know a <laughs> couple thousand barrels a day, which is just nuts. <laughs> Think about that. And so you know they're able to mitigate supply chain hiccups. You know they buy grain futures, and so their prices are locked in. So for us, it, it's always price variability is our biggest issue or you know if somebody's getting cut out of barrel allocation it's going to be us um that's the thing that we we have to to work through and be aware of fortunately we're in a state with uh with jack daniels and so we there's been barrel shortages and you know it, it's pretty cool to sort of get a phone call from jeff arnett the master stiller jack and say hey do you need any barrels and those guys would come through for us in a, in a pinch a couple of times so you know hats off to them they don't have to uh, be that way with a distiller that makes one barrel a week and other, other craft distillers in the state of Tennessee, but they are, and that's really cool. So you talk about that variance, and, and that's a really good segue for me. As we're going through this, and, and I kind of feel like we're, we're doing your greatest hits, right? We started off with your gin and moving into that black and tan, that black and tan was a variance that actually came from a happenstance, right? It was yeah. a, it was a unique accident that made the black and tan. Yeah, that yeah, it really was. Um, our black and tan. If you go to a store and you see white corn whiskey, unaged corn whiskey, white dog moonshine, whatever you want to call it, 
that's always a bourbon precursor. You know, people making that corn whiskey because men they're making bourbon or they're making Tennessee whiskey. That's why it's there. The black and tan was actually the result of us trying to make a really good unaged whiskey. My personal flavor preference is I'm not a fan of unaged corn whiskey. It's just not a flavor palette I like. So I, I was going to make a, a good unaged whiskey in doing so. Made this beer, oatmeal stout beer, and, and distilled it to get sort of an interesting, unique, smooth, unaged whiskey and it was good and it was it was really sort of outperforming our expectations and then my brother-in-law brings a bottle back to me still the only person to do that I and mean, then it was brown you know so he had taken a bottle of the unaged whiskey gotten a wine a oak spiral from a wine making store stuck it in the bottle stuck it in his garage for a couple of weeks and brought it back and it was fantastic so he stole your stuff is basically what you're saying he bought the whiskey and then he brought it back to me. <laughs> but he uh, he's like, you you have got to try this, and so I did, and we ended up drinking that bottle over the course of the weekend. And on Monday, I started putting new whiskey in barrels, and that was where the black and tan came from. It's even evolved since then. You know, we've gotten better at managing the barrels and aging, blending those barrels together, which is an art in and to itself, and. I just love that whiskey. Yeah. It's one of those sneaky whiskeys you got to be careful with. It, it goes down really easily. So, Zeke, that's kind of funny. You and I had a chance to taste this. I think it's pretty cool that we have the ability to do that. We taste it before we got on. We have some notes. The black and tan was pretty unique to me. What do you think? I guess not surprisingly, but somewhat laughable. It, it did seem to really embody what you would think of in a black and tan. Nose-wise, the, the oats was there. Seemed as somewhat of a younger whiskey but then as you moved into the palate it was a, a very dark beer component wise for lack of a better word is how I would classify it but it was very oaty it, it wasn't like a, a, a true Guinness flavor to me I got much more of an oat uniqueness that I don't think I've ever seen or found in any other um, whiskeys products etc it, it's definitely novel by all means and the funny thing is I got such a sweetness on the nose but the taste for me it was like a dark chocolate oak and I, I wrote down dark chocolate oak almost a little bit of coffee or cacao in there and, and and I just like saying that word cacao, but it was a chocolatey oak uh, that was in there. And then I I even got that on the finish too. You know, the finish for me it was just a lingering coffee chocolate taste, and the nose it was sweet, but it was a, a little bit malty too, where it almost kind of has that scotch component to it as well. Yeah, we intentionally, all of our spirits sort of tack towards the British Isles. Um, you know, our bourbon is uh, a little bit more malty than a lot of bourbons, and the black and tan is definitely a, a fusion of British beer and, and Scotch whiskey traditions. Guinness is a 100% barley malt beer, where the inspiration here was, you know, similar to Guinness, but more in the Sam Smith oatmeal stout ale. This whiskey is, is 49% unmalted oats. That just adds an earthy and a creaminess to it that you don't get from barley malt alone. You know, that scotch feel, that sort of, um, it's almost a texture. You know, barley malt whiskeys have a certain texture to them that, that is just unmistakable. And with this whiskey, the, the, the oats really soften that up, give it a creaminess in the middle. And we put a big dose of chocolate malt in there. It's 100% grain whiskey. We don't add coffee nibs or any you know sugars or any artificial flavors. It's 100% grain whiskey. But that coffee malt, which is what makes Guinness dark and Porter's dark and give them those coffee chocolate notes, we put a bunch of it in there. And we use a couple different yeast strains to, uh, to bring out those right notes to give us that really intense dark chocolate flavor that uh, really set this whiskey apart for those of you listening this comes in at 80 proof which is pretty in line with a lot of things that you're going to get for scotches you know mm -hmm. bourbon typically has that higher cast strength or, or things that are over 100 proof but when you really get into scotches there's not a lot of scotches that that go up in proof too much right there's really not, and so you know, with Scotch, they're uh, and Irish whiskeys, they're they're more about the grain that are mellowed by the barrel. You know, bourbons are very barrel intensive, and so the cast strength bourbons really do more to highlight the barrel intensity. That's not what we're aiming for with with this whiskey, and so at eighty proof, it really allows the chocolate to be more amplified. 
when you try that whiskey at a higher proof, you pick up on the chocolate, but it's more subtle and the grain flavor isn't as noticeable. So for me, keeping it in more in line with the scotch, I want it to be a grain noticeable whiskey and we amplify that chocolate by by keeping it at 80. For those guys listening, obviously you you can't see this uh, bottle or or the color density, etc. It's a lot lighter brown than you would think and I I think that yields to also the flavor that comes off of it being much more oaty than, than the malted barley that's in there. It is a good balance. I don't know if you do this at the distillery, uh, but I think it would be really fun to see this expression at various proofs. I know earlier offline you you mentioned you tried it and and why you put it at the 80 proof um, versus other flavor profiles that were there. But at least for me and and being a fan of of higher proofs most days, I think it would be really neat to see how this progresses from a 110 or 100 all the way down to an 80 and just see how much the palate can really vary from that. Wait, the guy only makes one barrel a week, and you're going to go make him do all these different proofs? No, it's okay. Uh, It'll be fun, you know. You know, sitting here looking at the, the color differential, you know, we've got um, one of our single barrels of bourbon that's that's is really dark brown, you know, almost red that you see. And that comes from the new oak. This, our black and tan, is actually, we use both new oak and used oak. And so... Uh, and we blend those together. You know, scotches are almost entirely second cast. And so you don't get those oak tannins. You don't get those almost red colors that you get out of a new barrel. And so the color is lighter. And there was actually an epiphany moment with this where the first several batches of black and tans got really spent those early months in the you know, Tennessee summer. And those whiskeys were really dark. And they were good, but then they were dark. They, were, they really tapped towards the bourbon flavor profile a little bit. Last December, you know, we... we released our first barrel of bourbon it sold out in like three hours and then we sold all of our black and tan like we didn't have any whiskey left at the end of the month of december that we could sell so we pulled some barrels starting in the middle of january february early february uh, to get our black and tan back on the market and the, they were really light in color and i sort of panicked i was like oh they're not ready yet you know they'd been up longer than some of our early barrels actually i tasted one of them and i was like oh my gosh this whiskey's better than the stuff that got hotter. It was really an eye-opening moment uh, for how to manage malt whiskey versus corn whiskey uh, and how to manage the black and tan. And so we've, we've really changed the way we treat that whiskey after that early, you know, sell out, sell out all your whiskey and man, we needed to, you know, we needed to sell some stuff. And we didn't have anything to sell and the, the, the bottle was really, really light in color. And I was like, you know, forget it. Let's, let's go with what's in the bar, you know, out of the barrel and, flip the script instead of making it look right let's just make it taste right <laughs> right <laughs> that's a good way to do it the proof is always in the pudding so that's a that's a pretty good segue as we you, know, you talked about the different colors between the black and tan and the bourbon you know as we progress along the greatest hits of hcd we then get to the end of 2016 in which you guys finally put out your bourbon it's aged two years now, it's interesting, the one that I have here, and, and you were nice enough to bring some of your own stuff, and, and I said, don't worry, I have the bourbon, and I actually have the first bottle of the second batch, and those you were actually doing short barrels, and that was a 13-gallon barrel, and the proof was a little bit higher than the one I have, that mine is about 100 proof. You're normally putting these out at 90 proof, but a couple interesting questions I have on that. Let's talk about how you go to the bourbon, but it, one question I have is, you know, this second batch had about 80, 80 bottles in the, the short barrel. What's the difference in the number of, of bottles you get from a short barrel opposed to an actual 53-gallon barrel? And then kind of talk about the transition from the black and tan to the bourbon. Sure. So with the, the short barrels, you know, 80 bottles is, is pretty good uh, out of those barrels. You know, with the smaller barrels, also you get much more angel share so we lose a lot more whiskey in a small barrel than you do a, a big barrel we we put up a bunch of whiskey in 25 and 30s bourbon and so the difference is a, a 25 gallon barrel will get between 140 and 180 bottles it just depends on you know leakage angel share various factors a full 53 gallon barrel 
you're looking at 250 to 270 bottles ish just in there again evaporation angel share leakage spill you know what do you spill sometimes you spill stuff that's sad um <laughs> You know, uh, we've had a couple barrels that, uh, one I call the barrel of sadness. I've got it at the distillery and one of the staves cracked and, you know, it leaked out. And so we go up there to pull that barrel and then it's only, it's gone. And oh. So, oh, it was so, it's crushing. So that stuff happens. Did you put um, it up on the wall just as a reminder yeah, so it could happen? Yeah, it, it's still in the shop. I'll show it to you if you come down, the barrel of sadness. I've started using it. If we're fixing stuff, we'll drill into it. I need to just go take it out to the farm and shoot at it a few times. And so, uh, you know, the short barrels are higher proof. A couple of reasons is I was always uneasy. For us, it wasn't about smoothing the whiskey out at that age. It's about making sure you manage the oak tannins right. Because that's where the youngness in, in a whiskey can be picked up. Is, is how, how are the oak tannins mellowing out? And and so at a higher proof a little bit, with the smaller barrels, there's less risk of those tannins jumping out as, as being young. And so that's why we kept it at 50 for those 15s. And with the, the 25s and 30s, I've felt like the whiskeys are more approachable at 90. And we're going to do a bottled and bond offering next year. What? Uh, yeah, well, next Christmas we're, we'll, we'll have a bottled and bond whiskey for with our bourbon that'll be back at 100. Uh, sort of limited release but uh for a craft distillery that's not something that happens all the time right no and and you know we make everything we we haven't outsourced production or private labeled anything and so we did the short barrels at two years you know but that was it's our stuff and uh, you know every drop of the stuff we sell we've made it 100 gallons at a time we'll be back with the high proofs for the high proof fans but whiskeys the, the, the aromas the flavors it's more approachable for more people at 90 and so uh um, that's why we put it there. Zeke, you and I again had a chance before we we started talking to Heath. We wanted to be prepared. We didn't want to come in and mess everybody up with us smelling and tasting. So we did try the bourbon before we got on the air. This one for me, the nose, I was, I was trying to pinpoint the nose. And as we were talking with each other, I mean, this nose is complete scotch for me. A lot of scotch on the nose. I, I get that malt. We talked about this. Why are you making a face at me? I mean, I know we talk about things, but I still speak, you know, Southern redneck and you still speak New Englander. So we have discrepancies from time to time. But I feel like you didn't listen to what we talked about before. Well, now you sound like my wife. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But I, I got a lot of scotch on this. On, on the nose, I just wrote candy bar malt. The nose on this, I felt like I was chocolatey, but toffee, nougat. All that that good candy bar stuff, but it felt a little malted. And then I said for the finish, it was that scotch again on the the medium and long finish. But what about you? Because it's looking at your face, it's probably different than what I said. No, um, I, I think uh, which happens more times than not. You we're day and night difference. Um, which I'm a big malt fan. I hate scotch, but I like malt. I don't know how that works out. People tell me it's not possible, but that's how I work. Sorry. Well, it's the I think the difference between an American malt and a, a scotch is the peat, right? Yep. So you're getting that that malt. If you like a malted milkshake opposed to a regular milkshake, there's a difference in that opposed to actually getting that peat in there. A lot of times with the scotch, you might get more of that Band-Aid smell and Band-Aid taste. With the malt, you just kind of get the malt. You don't get yeah, we that don't. There's stuff. no peat or smoke yeah. or anything like that in, our, in the bourbon. You know, my flavor palette tacks away from corn-forward bourbons. That's not where my preference is. And so we use 70% corn in this whiskey, 15% malt, and we use seven and a half each of wheat and rye. So we intentionally back off that corn forward nature. We want to amplify the malt and have a little bit of spice in there with the rye. And you know, the wheat's kind of a, a neutral flavor component. You get yield without a lot of flavor, some sweetness. I moved it towards scotch intentionally. I wanted it to be less corn forward and more balanced across the grain profile than you might typically find with some of the more well-known bourbons. And that's really where I picked up most of my notes from. For a nose-wise, I have toasted malt, slight corn up underneath, and really I, I 
as I got into it, I wrote down Frosted Flakes. That's really what came across to me as an olfactory memory more than anything was that crispiness on top of the cornflake. When I closed my eyes, what came out palate-wise, fiery on the flavor. Not necessarily a burn from the grain. It was just warming. I, I don't know if that may or may not make sense, but that's how I resonated. And as it moved, again, the malt really shone to me. I, I'm a fan of that. I, I resonate to it again. Finish-wise, nothing like some of the things with it, which obviously come from more time as far as being tobacco, tannin, linger. You can't expect that from something this young. I wouldn't say it's a knock. You just have to know what your product is going into it. You know, have reasonable expectations. So, Zeke, that that's completely, <laughs> that's completely different than what I got. I thought it was very enjoyable, and, and I appreciate the fact that there's benefits to... The people that are going out there and sourcing, but there's also a different benefit for a craft that's going out there and doing it themselves. Especially, we didn't even have enough time to get into all of this, but the way that Heath is actually doing this is not your typical, you know, he didn't go out and buy a $250,000 Vendome still. He's out there actually putting fire and water in there, burning the still himself, and there's a lot more that goes into that. It, it is an older process than you know some of these people that come in and spend the money and have doublers you know, you're actually running things through twice instead of a, of using a doubler right that's right we do we do two distinct runs you know we'll, we'll strip the beer in a direct fire still 100 gallon you know a lambic style still and alambic stills are designed to make brandy and so that mouthfeel that full mouthfeel that you know from brandy was was what i wanted to bring into the whiskey we get a little caramelization in the pot when we're stripping the beer, and so we're able to get some notes in our whiskeys that typically don't develop until they're much older than two. And we get that big mouth feel. A lot of, uh, of oils and flavors come over. I, I just, I just love what that equipment is doing. You know, it was sort of the bet the house purchased when we got going, and made an educated guess that it would do what it, I hoped it would do, and it, it's really performed and and getting a lot of flavor into the whiskey so that, you know, we can manage what goes in the barrel and create, you know, just flavors that uh, you're just not going to find everywhere. You know, my goal was to be very traditional in how we approach the bourbon, but try to move the needle a little bit. You know, bourbon's so defined and people know what it is and what the expectations is. And how do we make a different expression in that? And so that's what we're trying to do. I'm not just saying this because you're sitting here with us. I could go down and get a bourbon. There's so many things that you can get with bourbon that taste the same and everybody tries to market it different and that's what actually sets it apart. Pushing things forward is something that is interesting to me and I think that's one of the things that interests me about what you guys are putting out it's not just the same stuff that you could go out and it's a dime a dozen everybody's got that that label that being said I'm actually going to look at Zeke here for a second Zeke we've run through this whiskey gamut here the black and tan is $40 so it's $39.99 we have the Tennessee bourbon that's $79.99 I know the man is sitting right here with us, but tell me, would you spend your money on this stuff? I would, and it's actually funny because I know you've had a bottle for a while and we tried it some time ago. I've had multiple bottles, so I mean, you know where I'm sitting on this, and that's not just because he's here. He brought more, and I said I have some, so. No, and, and where I was going was just the fact that I really don't remember the flavor profiles from, I guess, an earlier release you gave me, probably that first release. It didn't resonate with me as much or my palate, but I really feel the malt and the balance with the oat is much better now. I'm, I'm with you on not being a corn forward person. Not much scares me off more than that, especially with something being young. And to put out a young product that is not corn forward to me is just ideal and something that I, I can really jump into and get behind. At the price, is it something I'm gonna have a case of sitting at the house? Probably not, but I do enjoy the product and where it is and, and the novelty behind it. If you're someone that likes malted products, this is really ideal. Lord knows how many big craft beer fans these days, but I think there's a whole sect of people that are going to pick up on the oat that's there along with the malt, and it really just be an interesting segue between craft beer junkies and somewhat like you know bourbon or whiskey people that could yield a very interesting following. 
one of the interesting things in whiskey and distilled spirits is with brandy, you know, you're, the precursor is wine, and people know what that is. And so they can connect to brandy because they've had wine. With malt whiskeys, there's beer. You know, beer is predominantly malt. And so there's that precursor to malt whiskey that everybody knows. And nobody in their right mind drinks corn beer. Um, <laughs> and so I think... Wait, that's uh, not mellow corn? <laughs> right. I think part of the mythology and around bourbon and the mystique is that there's no precursor to it that anybody consumes uh, with any regularity or <laughs> with any sanity. And so for me, with the black and tan... Um, now, we call the black and tan, a little side note, is we want to call it Tennessee Stout Whiskey, but our friends at the IRS wouldn't let us. Um, they're like, <laughs> I well, like that name. Right? It's honest. You know, we're, just, we're not trying to hide stuff. That was what it is. And they're like, well, Stout's a beer. You can't call it a whiskey a beer. I was like, I can go to the gas station right now and get some malt liquor that ain't liquor. You know, it's beer. I lost that argument. So uh, we've got the Tennessee black and tan. So anyway, but the, for me, be able to connect the dots between a beer and a whiskey uh, in a way that is not just unique and different, but good, was really a, a driver behind the black and tan. Rounding out that conversation, I would probably, once you get into that $80 territory, I think it's more of a luxury and it's not an everyday drinker. I would probably always have a bottle of the bourbon, but I'd probably have two bottles of the black and tan because that's something at 80 proof that's a good daily drinker. A lot of those things are moving to $30, $40. It's priced right and it tastes good and it's something that I enjoy having and it's something that's not always the same, right? Well, and it also falls into our philosophy very easily and very well. Blind tasting of random four glasses. I don't know anyone that's going to pick up that flavor profile. There's nothing more fun than having four random cups or three or whatever to someone to taste and let them just feel them out write down some notes and say all right which one did you like the best but i can't let me pull the bag down and show you what you like because you're not gonna believe me i mean that's always the best moment you know that i can't think of any way to rethink how you drink than putting stout with a whiskey we should also mention you brought something else here today and not everybody knows about it it's getting late We've been on for a while. Why don't you tell the people what else you brought? Because this knocked my socks off. One of the whiskeys we made a little bit of uh, way back when we first got going was our Tennessee rye. We brought a bottle tonight. We're going to be able to sneak some of this out. Um, get it bottled before Christmas. We're hopeful. If we can get uh We're printing our bottles. We're supposed to get those in. That's sort of the bogey. The Tennessee rye is a pretty tasty whiskey. I'm excited to release. We only have two barrels of it, so uh, we're going to let it all go. So he's being very subdued because he's tired right now. But this rye, this is he. You only have one barrel of this right now, right? Right, a two twenty-five gallon barrel. So we've got effectively one full-size barrel. And the mash bill on this, a hundred percent rye. Right? This one's a hundred percent rye. And so the challenge for us in making rye is rye is awful to work with. It's just really sticky. It's viscous. It. And so we run a direct fire still, and so it would burn. Um, and so we'd have to basically cut the beer down to where, even at our scale, it wasn't cost effective to run 100 gallons of wi- you know, beer and get five gallons of whiskey out of it. Over the years, we, we sort of revisit rye about once a year, make a couple barrels, trying some different techniques. We're definitely going to move away from the 100% rye mash bill, use some more malt and some oats in there to try to loosen up the, the beer so that it's a little more workable. I love rye whiskey, and uh, this is some of our earliest stuff. Some of this is three years old. Some of it's two and a half. So it's it's pretty tasty stuff. It's funny because you know we're not live for this, so you can't get the, the expressions or see what's really going on here. But to see him just now grab the bottle, shake it a little bit, and look at it, there's a twinkle of man. We really did good on this on the first run. <laughs> I, I don't know what we did or how. You know, damn if it didn't turn out tasting notes. good. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm jealous because it would be my dream to have my day job and then Moonlight owning a distillery. And full disclosure, when we first started Dad's Drinking Bourbon and we tried to do a blog and we realized that wasn't really working, you know, Heath was one of the first people that actually talked to us. That, that when I called, he actually <laughs> spent 
some time on the phone with me and and that was right when he was getting his bourbon out and i can only imagine working really hard to come where you have been and actually get something out that's yours and i think we understand that from a podcast point of view when you work hard at something and you actually put that out on your own for you to actually go put out your own product and put your name on it and basically say that that's yours and have it turn out well i bet there's no better feeling in the world it 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 doesn't get old. Um, it really doesn't, you know. And part of it is, you know, there's in Tennessee, there, there's this lost art of uh, sort of this drop by hospitality, you know. When growing up, people would just come by and, you know, mom and dad would, you know, make dinner. Whoa, here's what we got. Come, you know, come eat with us. And we don't do that much anymore. Um, and so, well, it, it, let me just stop you for a second because Zeke likes to point out that I'm from New England, but I think after spending some time with us, I think you've realized that I have taken to these southern customs pretty well. You're doing right? a pretty good job. He's a pretty yeah. good off season pickup for the South, uh, probably. I've been told I'm a northern good old boy. That's, <laughs> that's kind of what I've been told. <laughs> I like that. Being able to, you know, hand somebody, pour somebody a drink or hand them a bottle, for me, is an expression of that sort of long-lost hospitality. But I tell you, you know, being able to walk into Husk and see our stuff behind the bar, man, that's cool. That's pretty neat. Uh, or go to uh, Cork you, and Cow or, or, you know, Red Pony and they, they've got your stuff. And I'm like, man, that's cool. And so, all of you, I should just do a little disclaimer. If you're staying at the Omni Hotel in Nashville, Omni, you right. guys have that place pretty uh, outfitted. They probably with still HCD. have some barrel number one. They they bought a bunch of it. Do you know I went to them and I tried to go to them on the slide because I just wanted to have a bottle from the first batch. And I said, I will just pay you for a bottle of the first batch. They wouldn't do it with me. <laughs> I, I missed out on the, the oh. barrel release and I tried to go do that. But Zeke, before we get out of here, we are going longer than we normally do. Talk about the rye for a little bit because we've had a chance to taste it. There is that signature malt on the nose. And then I got a bunch of peanut brittle it was very smooth when I first tasted it. The back end, it's almost like the finish is where I get knocked out with taste and I get a lot of peanut brittle and the spice and I feel that rye spice kind of more in the back of my palate. Well, and granted, you and I both uh, perceive rye as completely different based on the, every tasting we, we have we, done. We perceive a lot of things differently. Which Let's is, get it. is fun and, and does prove that uh, every palate's unique. For me on the ride, nose-wise, I picked up a sweetness that I uh, attributed to the barley. Could just be the malt content in general, based on some other ones we tried tonight and have tried previously. That, that's where my mind raised. Well, there's no barley. Yeah, it's 100. percent This one oh. particularly is, is there's malted rye in it, but there's no malted barley in it. Well, in that case, I'm just picking up the malt. <laughs> but it makes you kind of rethink all the other stuff, right? And and I don't want to get us on a tangent because we're already long, but. You know, well, how much any, are we getting? I guess, I guess to me, uh, any malted grain, my brain picks up a very similar flavor. Uh, you can, I talked about that offline. I've had multiple single malt whiskeys, not a scotch, but you know, geared more bourbon wise, that regardless of the grain, I literally taste the same thing and I, you know, would just attribute that to the malt itself. Palette wise, it had a nice warmth. It did not. You know, jump up and scare me by any means, which plenty of rye's can do. As that moved further back into the palate, I felt like the flavor really opened up and, and yielded a, almost a charred or, or toasted finish. You know, that's a hot word sometimes with bourbon these days, or rye, whiskey, whatever you want to call it. But it, it was a nice balance of, of whether it was the char, whether it was a toast element. I don't know, it wasn't overwhelming, but it made a young grain seem more balanced. I'm pretty damn excited for this to come out. I know we've had some here. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's not enough to go around, so he actually has to take this home with him. But I am very, very excited to get a bottle of this because it's not like any rye I've ever tasted. And even for a conversation piece for me, to be able to bring this out and say, hey guys, have you ever tried this rye? Because it's not your typical rye profile that i think excites me more than anything i'm really not just saying this guys because he's here i i'm not afraid to tell a man to his face if he doesn't have good whiskey but damn that is an interesting rye i appreciate that you know it's mm. it's uh we work hard you know we, with one barrel a week sort of our, our net production we we can't miss what's your barometer 
uh, every step of the way and we've learned to trust our judgment on the, these things and uh, we like good stuff we like good wine and we being my wife and I and uh, good whiskey and so we uh, if we like it we we think it's probably going to be at least pretty good both of us sitting here we know that she's actually the one that is the brains behind the operation <laughs> no doubt she's the brain and your your name is on there. You got a nice hat. Yeah, you got I'm, a nice bottle. But yeah, you know. she's clearly the smart one. You know, she. Uh, so I mean, I'm the one working eighty hours a week. <laughs> so Zeke, would you? What do you think about the ride? I, I like it a lot. And again, uh, I wish you folks could have seen the expression because literally it was you grabbing the bottle, looking at it, giving it a shake, and the look on the face, and, and what I would assume the the thought process was, man. I, I don't know what I did here, but I did something really good. <laughs> and now I'm kind of worried if I can replicate it. But, man, this one here, I'm just going to ride it out. No, take, <laughs> take what you play the cards you got. Well, we certainly hope we does. And, and we know it's a little bit harder for those smaller places to do it. But we're certainly glad that we had a chance to try it. And we're certainly glad that Heath came and visited us. So Heath, tell the folks how they can get a hold of you. Tell them where they can find your your stuff because a lot of times it's in Middle Tennessee. Are you guys expanding at all? And, and what any plans for that? We're predominantly in Middle Tennessee and East Tennessee, and so there's still a lot of uh, uh, market capacity in Nashville, and so it's it's a lot easier to sell product here than it is you know 300 miles away. We're going to keep working keep working here come follow us on social media you know h clark distillery on instagram twitter facebook keep up with us that way love to have you come see us in thompson station you know we're uh we're right there in downtowns or one of five buildings <laughs> i i so, think there's uh, a there's a restaurant yeah circa right next door fantastic man they're good there's a train that you can go take uh, the kids caboose, on you know yeah. stomp on a caboose the town hall's an old uh, train depot you know the train still runs a couple times a day and it's cool where we sit uh, in actually an old civil war battlefield believe it or not so it's a very historic place and it's it's beautiful so growing up on a farm while i enjoyed my time at, at bass Berry, but being able to drive into thompson station and see cows and open fields is i'll take that any day of the week over uh, my view and bass was i could i could look down on the davidson county jail and watch the guys playing basketball <laughs> up on the roof in their orange jumpsuits but, so i'll take i'll take my cows yeah any I'm, day of the week i'm with you there over, over thanksgiving the the wife and kid got to uh, see and feed their uh, their first cow experience oh yeah how, how was that it was it was good it was fun i grew up country i, I appreciate those things and those yeah. moments and uh i'm, I'm with you 100 percent there oh, that's good stuff so and if you're around town here you know you can find us you know, craft brood or elixir and uh in spring hill craft brew on 12th uh frugal cork dorks uh, Red Dog, Bottle Shop, uh, Full Springs Wine and Spirits, Village, you know, tw- I mean, the, the list, fortunately, has gotten quite long. I can't always remember where we're at. And if you want to just try some before you buy the Omni or, you know, Husk, City Winery, if you're down in Franklin, come see us at Cork and Cow or Red Pony or 55 South, Circa and, and Homestead, those guys as well. So We get it. You're in a lot of places. So... <laughs> We're, 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 the list is yeah, you sort of look and up. And like, it's kind of crazy, you know. We just chip away one at a time, and finally, a few years into this, uh, we've got some coverage, so people have choices on where to find us. I feel like this night is a night of epiphanies for you. A little like you're bit. realizing as you're talking about it, <laughs> yeah. like, oh, we're actually well, in a lot a of places. places. You, you spend so much time in the trenches, you, it, it, you don't get to look up very often. Well, Zeke, the folks can find us on Instagram at Dad's Drinking Bourbon. They can find us on Twitter at Bourbon Dads. They can find us on Facebook at Dad's Drinking Bourbon. Is there any other place they can find us? Nashville, Tennessee. Well, we thank you all for joining us. Come back again and see us. Uh, go to Apple, Stitcher, Google Play. Please give us a five-star review. Tell us that you like us. If you don't like us, send us a direct message. We will try to make it better. Until then, we will see you next week. Zeke, say bye to the folks. Adios. Ciao. Aloha. Cheers. Cheers.